Okay, so let's get started. Um, so thank you everybody for joining us today for our um, cardiac rehab talk, um, which will be given by Sarah Chambers, who is a registered nurse and is the assistant nurse manager at the Cardiac Rehabilitation Center at Palm Beach Gardens Medical Center, um, as well as by Dr. Steven Trachtenberg, also known as Dr. T, um, who is the medical director here um, for, at the Cardiac Rehabilitation Center um, for Palm Beach Gardens. And they are gonna to talk to you today about how to manage risk factors to prevent and treat cardiovascular disease. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Dr. T and Sarah. Okay, good, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Before we can talk about what we mean by cardiac risk factors, well, before we can talk about the management of cardiac risk factors, we have to talk about what, what do we mean by cardiac risk factors. Could we have the next slide, please? A risk factor is something that increases or decreases a person's chance of developing a disease. Um, we're going to talk today about risk factors for cardiovascular disease, but there are many risk factors for other diseases. The most obvious ones are things like, um, like smoking is a risk factor for developing pulmonary disease. So what are the risk factors for cardiovascular disease? This just shows you an overview of the, um, of the various risk factors. Um, obesity, um, 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 improper diet, um, anxiety, stress, smoking, um, high blood pressure. And now we'll go in and talk a little bit more detail about these various risk factors. Heredity is probably the strongest of all the risk factors for arteriosclerosis, but we don't spend a lot of time talking about it and trying to manage it because we don't get a chance to pick our parents. However, there's a great deal of research being done trying to determine which chromosomes and specifically which genes on the chromosomes are responsible for increasing somebody's risk for developing um, uh, card cardiovascular disease. And some of that research um, is targeting on how we can manipulate the genes. And we may find sometime in the near future that we can actually do some, um, make some changes genetically to try to prevent um, the development of, of heart disease. But right now, heredity is just something that we have to live with. Aging. So many heart programs are simply due to aging. Since the heart beats 100,000 times a day, 2.5 billion times roughly in a lifetime, the arteries are subject to constant stress. And from that constant stress, it can damage the lining of the arteries, making it more vulnerable to the development of arteriosclerosis, which is also known as hardening of the arteries. Unfortunately, there's little we can do to slow the process of aging. So therefore, we want to strive to control the risk factors that we can control. One of the other risk factors that we have little control over is one's sex. Prior to menopause, women have the onset of coronary disease approximately 10 years, on average 10 years later than their male counterparts. This is an, an interesting subject. It's actually been studied in, in great detail. Um, since women have the onset of heart disease at a later age, they did studies way back about 50 or 60 years ago where they tried to give men uh, female hormones, estrogens and progesterones to try to make them more like women. Now, of course, any women in the audience will say, there's no way you can make a man more like a woman, but they did um, increase the pitch of the uh, man's voice. Um, the men grew breasts, it's called gynecomastia. But unfortunately, it did not prevent, as a matter of fact, it seemed to accelerate the process of arteriosclerosis. So hormone therapy to try to um, feminize men was quickly abandoned. However, most of you women um, who are a little bit older will remember that until the 1990s, um, since heart disease became more common in women after menopause, women were given um, hormone replacement therapy, estrogen and progesterone to try to delay the onset of menopause. And we thought that was standard therapy. They called it HRT, hormone replacement therapy. And it was given to virtually all postmenopausal women until a study was done in the 1990s, a women's heart study that showed that, that um, giving women estrogen and progesterone did not prevent heart disease. It actually increased risk of cervical and breast cancer and did nothing to delay the onset of heart disease. So these studies were also rapidly abandoned. 
ethnicity. So there have been many studies to show that ethnicity plays a role in the risk of developing cardiovascular disease. For example, Blacks, especially Black women, have a greater chance of developing coronary artery disease compared to whites, and that may be due to high blood pressure. Uh, people of Asian ex extraction tend to have lower rates of coronary artery disease, perhaps due to their higher HDL or their good cholesterol levels. But that is changing since uh, a lot of Asian countries have developed Western diets. We, we're starting to see a shift in that as well. So we talk a lot about cholesterol. Let's, let's spend a few minutes talking about what actually is cholesterol. Cholesterol is a fatty substance that's present in the blood of all animals. And it's an important building block in the manufacture of um, corticosteroids, um, also known as cortisone, and the production of bile from the gallbladder. Also, there's a, um, a fatty layer around our brain and around our nerves that protect the brain and nerves. And this is essentially made out of fats, especially cholesterol. So while cholesterol has been given a bad name, the first thing you should realize is that, is that some cholesterol is an essential fat in our body. The cholesterol level, when, when the doctor measures your cholesterol level, when they do a blood test and comes back and gives you some numbers, the cholesterol level that's obtained is a combination of heredity and, and your diet. Um, heredity probably plays an even larger role than what you eat, but certainly what you eat is very important. The strong evidence that lowering your bad cholesterol, your LDL, I'll come back to that in a minute, will prevent pro uh, progression of arterial sclerosis, and in some cases can actually lead to, to regression of the, of the plaques that form in the arteries, especially the arteries in the heart. You hear the terms good and bad cholesterol. What is meant by bad cholesterol? Well, cholesterol doesn't flow freely in our bloodstream. It's attached to proteins called lipoproteins. And the low density lipoprotein, abbreviated LDL, that's a protein that carries a cholesterol which is deposited in the lining of the arteries leading to the plaque formation. In this little um, cartoon uh, that you see off to the right, the top is meant to show a normal artery and the, the bottom, the middle, a little fuzzy, but that shows you the early development of a plaque. And on the bottom, you see a plaque that actually is about blocking the artery about 50%. So the LDL is a bad cholesterol because that's the one that's transporting the cholesterol that forms the plaque. Good cholesterol um, is carried by the so-called high density lipoproteins, which we call HDL. And we think that's a protein that actually picks up the cholesterol that's not needed or is in the wrong place and removes it from the body. And people that have high levels of HDL seem to have a lower risk of, of um, coronary artery disease and arteriosclerosis in general. In other words, it seems to be protective. Well, because of that, uh, there were many um, um, medications that were developed to try to raise the HDL. But unfortunately, most of them, even though they raised the HDL, didn't uh, prevent the development of heart disease. So it's thought that a um, high HDL may be a marker. It doesn't actually cause the, um, the heart disease to diminish. So again, to summarize, lowering the level of LDL cholesterol in the blood has been clearly shown to prevent the progression of arterial sclerosis. And as I said, in some studies to actually cause regression of the plaque. So cigarette smoking is a huge risk factor, one that you can control. Cigarette smokers have two and a half to three times the incidence of arteriosclerosis as non-smokers if all risk factors are equal. It's believed that it's the chemicals in the smoke, not the actual nicotine, that damages the inner lining of the blood vessel known as the endothelium. And the good news is that about seven years after stopping smoking, your risk of arterial sclerosis is no higher than those who have ever smoked, never smoked. And, you know, we're talking about the heart, not the lungs. So smoking cessation is essential for all of your body. All the blood vessels are damaged with cigarette smoking. Hypertension. Um, before we talk about hypertension, let's talk about what we mean by blood pressure. Blood pressure, which is abbreviated BP, 
is the actual pressure produced by the contracting heart muscle. Now the heart is a, is a muscle, it's a hollow muscle which pumps blood to every part of the body. And as it pumps the blood, the blood comes out under a certain pressure. And the pressure that's developed during the contraction of the heart is referred to as the systolic blood pressure. Um, in between um, contraction of the heart, when the heart is resting, there's a residual blood pressure, which is referred to as a diastolic blood pressure. And it's displayed as systolic over the diastolic, for example, 120 over 80. Now, hypertension, also known as high blood pressure, they're interchangeable and they mean the same thing, um, has a very strong hereditary um, component. Hypertension is a vascular disease. Some people think of high, hypertension as being a disease of, of nerves or anxiety. And while it's true that, that being nervous or anxious can raise your blood pressure, it's not, a, it's not an emotional disorder. It's an actual vascular disorder. And we think that it's caused by the kidney regulation of salt, specifically sodium. Um, the higher the blood pressure, the more stress on the arteries and therefore more damage to the lining of the arteries, the endothelium. So hypertension is a strong risk factor for, excuse me, for all forms of arteriosclerosis, for heart disease, for um, scleros arteriosclerosis of the arteries to the brain, which causes stroke, and arteriosclerosis of the circulation to the lower extremities. What actually causes high blood pressure? Well, we think that the basic problem seems to be an inability of the kidneys to eliminate salt. And since the kidneys can't eliminate salt adequately, the retained salt gets into the arteries and makes them stiffer, which is the mechanism which we think raises the blood pressure. So what to do? So to treat high blood pressure, other than medication, you want to watch your salt intake. Limiting salt, it's also known as sodium or the symbol Na+, that all means salt to less than 1,500 milligrams a day. And that's only two thirds of a teaspoon of salt. So we're not talking much salt at all for the whole entire day. All processed foods contain salt. Here we have different colors of salt. You know, the regular salt shaker, like I said, one teaspoon is 2,300 milligrams. So you wanna keep your sodium level to about 1,500 milligrams a day. There's pink salt in deli meats, which are very high in sodium. Black salt, such as soy sauce, green and pickles, red salt, you can find it in ketchup. So a lot of condiments have a lot of sodium. Learning to read labels is essential. It'll tell you on every label how much sodium is in what you're eating. And if you calculate everything that you add up during the day, keeping less than 1,500 milligrams can be pretty tricky. All processed foods contain um, sodium, fast foods super high in sodium. Canned food like this chicken noodle soup probably has two days worth of sodium in it. I'm not sure, I can't see the label, but I wouldn't be surprised. Brown salt in gravy, hidden salt is pretty much everywhere, bread, you know, baked goods. So again, learning to read labels is essential to keep your salt level lower to help reduce blood pressure. If I may just add something what Sarah is saying, reading level, labels is so important in getting the actual numbers because there's a lot of false advertising. For instance, in, in canned soup, they'll say it's um, a low sodium or reduced sodium but the soup may have as much as 900 milligrams of, of sodium and a reduced version may have 700 milligrams. So even though it's reduced or they call it lower or um, low sodium, it's really not low sodium. Read the labels, find out how many milligrams and then you'll add them up and try to keep them below that 1500. And you also need to look at the serving size because I believe that a can of soup says two servings but many people would eat the whole can. So if it's two servings, you need to double the amount of sodium. Say if it says 500 and you eat two servings worth, then you've had a thousand milligrams. So contrary to popular belief, most obesity is not hereditary, but due to poor nutritional habits and lack of exercise. The U.S. adult obesity rate is now at 42.4%, which puts us in a national crisis. 
The obesity rate has increased by 26% since 2008. And markedly since 1970s, the obesity rate has increased quickly due to fast foods, um, increased portion sizes, many reasons, but uh, those are the two main ones, fast food, processed foods, and increased portion size. Extra weight causes the work of the heart to increase. It increases blood pressure, increases cholesterol, increases blood sugar, which could lead to diabetes. So according to the American Heart Association, there's um, five steps to help lose people lose weight. Number one is to set realistic goals. You want short-term achievable goals to keep you on track toward your long-term goals. So say you wanna lose 50 pounds this year, maybe, you know, five pounds in two weeks, short achievable goals. Um, so, so that you set yourself up to change your eating patterns. You don't want to just lose weight quickly. There's many studies that show that these quick, quick weight loss uh, diets lead to yo-yo dieting, which then you increase the weight more quickly and oftentimes put on more than you lost and you go back and forth, which is terrible for your metabolism. So short-term goals, long-term goals, trying to reach those goals. Number two, understand how much you eat and why you eat. There's a lot of emotional eating when we're sad, when we're bored. If you use a food diary, or there's a lot of good tra tracking apps on phones and computers now to help you understand your eating habits. And maybe it's as simple as when you're watching TV, you do something different like, um, lift a few weights or get one of those little bicycle things that you can put on the floor and just pedal, something to change your habit from sitting and eating. You wanna really manage your portion sizes. So the data shows that portion sizes have increased markedly over the past 20 years. I think it's 30 to 40%. Really big um, portion size increase Watch, you know, the, the soda, make smart choices. If you can stop drinking soda and juices completely, that decreases your caloric intake markedly. You want to avoid the white carbs, which is processed foods, breads, donuts, cakes, all those things that we seem to enjoy a lot in America. <laughs> and try to replace with fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. You wanna to try to be more physically active and aim for 150 minutes of moderate activity a week. You don't need to run. You can take nice walks while it's cooler outside, bike, swim, something so that you're moving more and sitting less. Just to elaborate a little bit more on that, there have been many studies to show that sedentary lifestyle is a, is a very significant risk factor for disease. Now it's, it's hard to do um, what we call a controlled study. You can't take a group of people and say half of you exercise and half of you don't, but there have been ways they can study it. For instance, they can, they can um, look back on people and ask them how much exercise they do on a regular basis. And they've clearly shown that the people that exercise more seem to reduce their risk of, of cardiac disease. And one study showed that you can reduce your risk of a heart attack by 30%. That's a big, big decrease. That's as much as you can re reduce it by stopping smoking or by um, lowering your cholesterol just by exercising 45 minutes a day, four to five days a week. There are different types of exercise. Um, cardio, also known as aerobic exercise, um, is the exercise that will, uh, or is exercise that means movement exercise. You're not um, working against a lot of resistance, but you're doing a lot of movement. And it's good for you because it increases the heart rate and that helps to strengthen the heart. It makes the heart stronger. It increases your lung capacity. Uh, you have more energy when you're exercising regularly. Uh, people tend to sleep better um, and have less stress when they exercise. And there have been studies to show that people that exercise have an improved um, immune system. The other um, main type of um, movement exercise 
is resistance exercise or weight training. Um, and this um, is meant to increase muscle mass, increase of bone density. It's been especially helpful in, in women. Um, Postmenopausal women seem to be at great risk of developing osteoporosis and doing uh, resistance training seems to help um, delay that, but it's also very good from a cardiovascular point of view. And it helps keeps your joints flexible. So while weight training is probably not as important as the cardio training in terms of preventing heart disease, it is important in terms of the body. Anxiety, many anxiety, pardon, anxiety, um, can anxiety will result in increased respiratory rate, increased heart rate, and increased blood pressure. Um, it's unclear whether anxiety itself can um, induce something like a heart attack, but there is no doubt that people that are under chronic stress have a higher level of adrenaline in their bloodstream. And it's believed that this higher level of adrenaline causes damage, again, to the lining of the arteries of the heart. So trying to avoid stress by whatever ways you can do it, by exercising, by taking medication, by getting counseling, all is important in terms of controlling cardiovascular disease. So yoga, I'm a certified yoga instructor, so I highly believe in the benefits of yoga to reduce stress, which is key to heart health. Uh, yoga or meditation, which is just basically yoga without movement, is one way to help decrease stress. So when you're doing yoga and you're actively breathing and monitoring your breathing and adding some stretching, you activate the parasympathetic nervous system, which lowers heart rate and blood pressure. And interestingly, we could have done our own study here at Palm Beach Gardens Medical Center Cardiac Rehab. When I was teaching yoga classes to our patients on heart monitors, Almost 100% of the time during class, heart rates would drop and blood pressure would be lower after the class. So we do know it works. It also helps to reduce cortisol and other inflammatory markers in the body, which um, can lead to heart disease by chronic inflammation in the body. There's a lot of studies out now showing that yoga is highly effective in decreasing the stress of the body, lowering the heart rate and the blood pressure. We're hoping to go to Zoom yoga classes soon. So keep checking the Palm Beach Gardens uh, website for education classes and hopefully soon. So the role of cardiac rehabilitation. Um, what we're all about is, um, as this cartoon shows, repairing broken hearts, repairing hearts that are, that are diseased in one way or another and trying to rehabilitate them. So what is cardiac rehab? It's a prescribed, medically supervised um, exercise and education program designed to help you recover after a heart attack, after implantation of a stent, um, if you have heart failure, or if you've had um, heart surgery, either valve surgery or bypass surgery. Um, it includes risk factor management, all the things that Sarah and I have been talking about. We try to emphasize with all our patients and give them guidance on how they can manage their risk factors. And we also provide emotional support. Many people after um, a cardiac event are very nervous and very anxious or afraid to exercise. And we try to help show them what types of exercise are beneficial um, and how they can do it safely. So our program is open Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, and we would give you a one hour time slot in a small group setting to help, like Dr. Trachtenberg said, repair or improve your heart muscle. So we have a highly trained staff of cardiac nurses and cardiologists that will individually assess and develop an exercise program to meet your needs. And we try to focus a lot on it education to modify the risk factors that we just talked to you about. So if you've had a heart problem or have heart disease, you should talk to your cardiologist or your PCP and see if you would be eligible to come to our cardiac rehab program.
So our cardiac rehab program at Palm Beach Gardens Medical Center is located at 2503 Burns Road. And um, our phone number is 561-776-8201 if you have any questions. Again, if you have had any heart issues, please talk to your doctor and you would need a prescription and then we'll get you started. So thank you again so much. And um, as Sarah mentioned, you know, go ahead and visit the Palm Beach Gardens Medical Center website on the events tab to learn about um, some of the other Zoom lectures that we have going on and to see if we are able to start up this, the um, chair yoga sessions on Zoom as well. So thanks guys for joining us and thank you for participating.